All right. Uh, we're going to turn first to Matthew chapter 7, verse 15 through 20. The sermon this morning is about Bible bewares. Uh, we're going to look at six different things that the Bible tells you to beware of. So Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. Okay. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire, Wherefore, by their fruits, ye shall know them. Okay, uh, keep your hand there. Well, actually, no, I guess you don't need to keep your hand there. We can remember pretty much what we read. Turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13. Now, we've been over this passage of Scripture before. I did a whole message on wolf hunting um, where I got into this in a lot more detail, but I just wanted to repeat it again because it is one of the Bible bewares. And there's a lot more than six, by the way. I just chose six because, you know, the number kind of, it's a good number to pick for something to beware of. Um, but Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Um, one of the most misunderstood things out there in this world today is people think that Satan's ministers you know, look a lot like Anton LaVey wearing all black and shaved head and a little thin goatee and stuff and black fingernails and black lipstick or something. That's not really one of Satan's ministers. And if you, and I'm not saying to study Satanism, you know, I, I don't think that is for every Christian. You know, there's a carnal curiosity thing that can come in there and you get messed up. But if you look into what Satanism is, it's about the flesh. It's really not about the devil. Because, see, a real true minister of Satan would not be in some black room, you know, with a human sacrifice in front of them. A true minister of Satan will be in a church. And I'm not just talking about Catholic churches or Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses. I'm talking Bible churches, quote-unquote. And you say, but yeah, but they would be producing fruit then. Well, turn over to Galatians chapter 5. We're going to look at the, uh, the list of fruit that is produced and that's how a lot of people will defend well I'm getting ahead of myself here let's read the list quick uh, Galatians chapter 5 verse 22 but the fruit of the spirit is love joy peace long suffering gentleness goodness faith meekness temperance against such there is no law now can a false prophet produce those things yeah but they'll be false fruits. They have love. They have plenty of love. In fact, that's their main platform that they will preach. But it's not scriptural love. Okay? They'll talk about loving our enemies as in not judging them and not telling them that they're going to hell. That's love for your enemy. No, it isn't. Not according to the Bible. If you love your enemy... You will let them rebuke you. You will be long-suffering to them. And you will tell them about hell. You will tell them that they are a sinner. That's loving your enemy. Loving your enemy is not, oh, let's just be friends and let's get along and I won't cut on you. I won't judge you. That's not love. But that's what the false prophets are preaching right now. That you just overlook people's, you know, let's, we believe in diversity and let's all come together and put aside our differences. That's not of the Lord. But that's the fruit that they will produce, and it's evil fruit. Okay? Um, joy. What does a false prophet teach for joy? 
material things. Yeah, Joel Olstein. You know, your best life now, and he's up there smiling and everything. Of course he's smiling. He's taking all their money. The guy's making millions of dollars. Sure, he's got plenty of joy in his life. You know, peace. You know, Rick Warren, he comes out and he's saying, you know, he has his five-point plan or whatever, and part of it is world peace. But what is the what is his method of world peace? It's for Muslims and Catholics and Christians and Buddhists and everybody to come together. See? So he produces, he, he talks about the fruit of peace, but his fruit is corrupt fruit. It's evil. So you got to watch out for that. And you go down through the whole thing, gentleness, goodness, faith. A false prophet will be very gentle. And he'll speak very kind and very nice. They'd never think of getting up there and saying, you're a sinner and you're going to hell, you know. They'd never go out street preaching or anything else because that's judgmental and doesn't show the love of Christ, you know, all that. So you got to watch out for that, okay? We're going to get into that a little bit more in a little bit. But I would say probably that 90 to 95% of the churches in America right now, and I'm talking, I'm not talking Baptist churches, I'm just saying any church, anything that has a steeple, and a church name out front, 90 to 95% of them are run by false prophets. I guarantee you. Lutheran churches, Presbyterian churches, false prophets. You go there, you won't hear about hell, you won't hear about sin or judgment or the wrath of God. All you'll hear is love, and it's all fake love. Okay, They'll pick a couple verses, and that's all that they'll preach on. Okay, you'll get a 10-minute sermon, and the rest of the time it's just praise and worship stuff. Okay, so beware number one, false prophet. And if you want more in-depth on that, I'm not going to get really deep into that because I really covered it in the wolf hunting message. You can hear that one uh, to get more in detail on false prophets. Okay, turn back to Matthew chapter 16. We're going to look at the second beware. Matthew chapter 16. Verse 6. Okay. Matthew chapter 16, verse 6. Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread. Which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves because ye have brought no bread? Do ye not yet understand, neither remember the five loaves of the five thousand, and, men, and how many baskets ye took up? Neither the seven loaves of the four thousand, and how many baskets ye took up? How is it that ye do not understand that I spake it not to you concerning bread, that ye should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees? Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Okay? So, the second one uh, that you have to be aware of is false doctrine. Alright, turn over to Mark chapter 8, verse 15. The next book over, Mark eight fifteen. We're going to see another aspect of this um, leaven. Beware of the leaven. Uh, here you have basically the same story being retold in uh, Mark here. Okay, Mark 8.15 says, And he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, and of the leaven of Herod. I thought that was kind of strange there, uh, that he would throw that in there. Tell them to beware of the leaven of a politician. I thought that was kind of interesting. But... What does the uh, Bible in Romans 13 call a politician? For he is the minister of God to thee for good. Can a politician quote-unquote preach? Absolutely. Can a politician be worshipped? Yeah. Yeah? You know? Yeah, the final one's going to be, of course, the Antichrist. But right now, right now, just this past week, an elementary school rewrote the words to... Uh, G 
Jesus loves me, I think it is. And they, they made it Obama loves me. Yeah. And they're showing these, these elementary schools all across the country are rewriting Sunday school songs and putting Obama's name in there. That is an abomination. That is wicked. That is satanic. And that's what's happening. Beware of the leaven of Obama. <laughs> you know? Be careful about that. And let me tell you something. I'm, I want to say something, which I've been, you know, I've heard this thing over and over again. Our last president, George W. Bush, I heard it from pulpits time and time again. Oh, I just thank God for George W. Bush. Oh, George W. Bush, such a fine Christian man. Okay? And all these guys that were saying this, they would judge others for being a drunk. They would judge others for swearing, for being a hypocrite, saying that Islam is okay. We had that in another one of our sermons where George W. Bush said that, that Muslims are going to go to heaven. You know, Not to mention the fact that George W. Bush is a member of Skull and Bones, the Bohemian Grove. They say he's a Mason. I can't document that. But the point is, if he were anybody else, a lot of the preachers would have been like, that guy's a hypocrite. He's not saved. No way. Oh, but, but we're so anxious to have a Christian leader that will overlook those things. See? And I heard him, he stood up the one time and he was stumbling around. He was trying to talk about, you know, taking the uh, beam out of your brother's eye and, you know, the moat that's in your own eye. And he was messing the, the thing all up. If he was anybody else, people would have rebuked him. But, oh, we got a Christian president. He's Republican, you know. He's got to be a Christian. No. Beware of that. Beware of wanting so badly to get a Christian politician that you overlook the reality that they're not really saved. You know, be careful of that. We, you know, there's that desire among Christians to have a Christian nation where our leader is a good Christian, he's a Bible believer, and he's going to make things better for us, and we're going to have mighty revival and everything. Be careful of that. Okay? Uh, Luke 12, verse 1. Look over here quickly. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Luke chapter 12, verse 1. Jesus here defines this leaven of the Pharisees and uh, Herod a little bit better. In the meantime, when there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trod one upon another, he began to say unto his disciples, First of all, Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Okay? Uh, now we've studied this thing as well, that, you know, our love as Christians is to be without dissimulation, which is just another way of saying basically hypocrisy. You know, that's what this leaven is. And you'll see that among false prophets, false teachers. They are hypocrites. They will stand up and they will teach and preach one thing, and behind the scenes there's something totally different. You know, George W. Bush was that way. He'd stand up and he would, you know, one minute he's interviewed and, oh, Jesus is my Savior. You know, oh, yes, I, I, I accepted Christ, you know, years ago. And, you know, and then I remember that there was actually, I think it was either the first or the second time that he was running for president. He was at a press conference and he thought the microphone was off. And he turned to Dick Cheney and he said, some reporter had asked him a question. He turned to Dick Cheney and he said, that guy's a real A, you know. Yeah. I mean, use the whole word there. I'm not going to say it. But, you know, another time he was he was on the air and he, he did the middle finger, you know. I mean, just, he said it's a one finger victory salute. And he's laughing about it. Like a little, like some little high school kid, you know, you know, see, he's a hypocrite. He goes from that to this teary eyed, oh, I, I'm a Christian and I accepted Jesus and oh, he's such a big influence on my life and I pray and, uh, and then he, and then he goes from that to, oh, you know, Muslims are going to heaven and I, you know, I can't judge, you know, see, hypocrite. And that's what a lot of these preachers are too. And you got to watch out for that. But, Something that I really want to cover, 
Um, I've been wanting to, to do this for a while. If you are a King James Bible believer that believes in the old hymns and you have some standards about dress and speech and I won't watch this and I won't watch that, modern Christians will call you a Pharisee. They'll say, oh, you're a Pharisee. You know, I remember Marty and I had a discussion on that the one time. Some people were saying that he was a Pharisee. And he said, you know, you actually look at what a Pharisee was. We're not the Pharisees. So I want to look very quickly. What is a Pharisee? What is a Sadducee? And what is a scribe? Okay, turn over to Luke 18. We're going to see what a Pharisee is. Luke chapter 18, verse 10. Okay. Uh, two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. Publican was a government worker like a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week, I give tithes of all that I possess." And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. What is a Pharisee? Self-righteous. Somebody who will not admit that they are a sinner. Now, talk to a modern Christian sometime, a modern professing Christian. Pardon me, are you a sinner? Well, I don't really think I'm that bad of a person. I mean, I've never killed anybody. I, you know, I think that God's going to put my good works and my bad works in a scale, and if the good works outweigh the bad works, then I'll get in. And you know, they won't admit to being a sinner. They're self-righteous. Hey, are you a sinner? Yes. I don't have to think about it for one second. I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. You know, I'm I'm fearful of having to stand before, you know, the Lord Jesus, kneel before the Lord Jesus, you know, and have to give an account of my life. I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. I'll freely confess that. I'm not perfect. But if you're self-righteous, oh, I'm not a sinner. You know, that atheist I was debating, I kept saying, are you a sinner? No, I'm not a sinner. I'm not a sinner. I, I, no, no. See? That's a Pharisee. And a lot of these modern, quote-unquote, Christians are going to these churches and they want to come out feeling better about themselves. You know, I had a, a guy, a friend of mine, don't really talk to him much anymore, but but uh, he told me the one time that, that they stopped going to a church because all that guy, do, all he does is preach on sin and you come out of there feeling bad about yourself. And that's not why you go to church. You go to church to feel good about yourself what he told me you know what his problem was he's a pharisee i'm a good person i'm not so bad you know i give tithes i i i do good works i pray i you know mm -hmm. pharisee yep okay what is a sadducee turn over to acts chapter 23 verse 8 Here you have Paul on trial and he spreads a little bit of division purposefully. I always like this story, but we're just going to read the one verse. Acts chapter 23 verse 8 says, For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. Okay, the Pharisees were self-righteous, but at least they knew the scriptures. The Sadducees, on the other hand, were a sect of, that say that say that there is no resurrection, that they they do not believe in angels or spirit. Okay, so what would they be today? If you're modern liberal, you know. Well, I think the Bible teaches some good things, and you can learn some good morals from the Bible, but we don't interpret it literally. Mm -hmm. Now, did you ever meet a King James Bible believer that doesn't believe in the resurrection or angels or the spirit? No, we're not the Sadducees. The modern liberal is the Sadducee, okay? They're the ones that Jesus attacked. 
What about a scribe? Uh, turn back to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, verse 22. Okay, Mark chapter 1, verse 22 says, And they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority, and not as the scribes. Turn back to 1 Timothy chapter 6. We'll define it here, what a scribe really is. Okay, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 3. If any man teach otherwise, and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, Supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. There you have your Bible corrector, the scribe. Well, I've been to college, you know, and it's my job to, you know, ensure that the scriptures are properly transmitted to the people and, and you, know, you know, all that stuff. And you go to these churches where you have a scribe as the pastor, and they'll spend the whole service trying to show you how intelligent they are. That's what a scribe does. They strive about words. They don't say, hey, that's what the Bible says. They'll say, well, now, strife there. The Greek word for strife is habaladubada, you know, or something, you know, I don't know Greek. I don't care to learn it. But, you know, that's the Greek word there, and it, it would be better translated as, you know, contentious wanderings or something, you know. And you, you never... You never get a concrete thing. And then if you'd say, well, what, well, contentious wonderings would, would make it say this. Well, yes, but it could also be translated as, see, and it just, you know, you end up having no final authority but the scribe. And that's the point of the scribe. So now, getting back to what I originally said, the Pharisee, the Sadducee, the scribe that Jesus Christ attacked, are, were they Bible believers? No. We are not Pharisees. We are not Sadducees. We are not scribes. The modern, quote-unquote, Christian, college-educated, Bible college-educated, they are the Pharisee, the Sadducee, the scribe. Okay? Just wanted to clear that up. So, beware number two, false doctrine of the Pharisees, the politician, the scribe, the, the Sadducee. Beware number three, Turn back to Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12, verse 38. Okay. All right. Mark chapter 12, verse 38 says... And he said unto them in his doctrine, Beware of the scribes which love to go in long clothing and love salutations in the marketplaces and the chief seats in the synagogues and the uppermost rooms at feasts, uh, which devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. These shall receive greater damnation. Okay, what is beware number three? Man-pleasers. That's what they are. They want... To be honored of men, they wear long robes and they and they wear all these things to make themselves look big. Turn over to Luke chapter twenty. Luke chapter twenty, verse forty-five. Here we read it again. Okay, uh, then in the audience of all the people, he said unto his disciples. Jesus didn't take them out secretly and say, no, I didn't want to say anything in front of the leaders of the synagogue, okay? And don't spread it. I don't want to name any names. I don't want to make any problem. He said, hey, here in the synagogue, everybody listen. You know, 
Beware of the scribes which desire to walk in long robes and love greetings in the markets and the highest seats in the synagogues and the chief rooms at feasts, which devour widows' houses and for sh for a shoe make long prayers. The same shall receive greater damnation. Okay. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We're going to look at what a real preacher is. Of course, we're going over this right now in our Bible study. So you pretty much know where I'm going with this. But um, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world which come or that come to naught. Look over at verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Uh, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Of course, if you read 1 Corinthians chapter 1, you will see that the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Okay? It's not with enticing words of man's wisdom. But it's interesting. I have here this book. I want to read a quote here very quick. Um, as early as the 3rd century, Christians called their sermons homilies, the same term Greek orators used for their discourses. Today, one can take a seminary course called homiletics to learn how to preach. Homiletics is considered a science applying rules of rhetoric which go back to Greece and Rome. Put another way, neither homilies nor homiletics have a Christian origin. They were stolen from the pagans. A polluted stream made its entrance into the Christian faith and muddied its waters, and that stream flows just as strongly today as it did in the 4th century. And he's absolutely right on that. Uh, and it's it's kind of sad to think that, you know, you go to a Bible college and, you know, you got a bunch of Christians sitting around or professing Christians sitting around, you know, well, I think that you should have uh, maybe said this word and I think you should have accented this point a little bit stronger and tried again, you know. And, oh, that was a good performance. That's not of the Lord. That's ridiculous. And and what you're doing is you are actually studying to be a con artist. You know? And um, i got to put on a little act here for a minute because it's something, you know, I need to kick. Uh, one of the uh, previous sermons I did on uh, unscriptural pacifism, you know, I, I had to listen to a couple hours worth of recordings by this Denny Keniston guy. And that guy... He said a lot of things that are that are true and fine and whatever, but he was so stinking fake. I mean, it's ridiculous. And I'm going to give you an example of his style of preaching. And bear with me here; I gotta do my little act. But this is here's one of my be, my bewares. Beware of roller coaster preachers. I'm going to read a verse of scripture here. I'll read verse 14 of Second Corinthians chapter two as a roller coaster preacher would. Okay. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them. Because they are spiritually discerned. See, there's my act. Okay, I'm done with that. See, what is that? I mean, if you came to me and you said, Hey, Brian, you know, how's your truck running? Oh, it's running good. But it has an oil leak. And I'm hoping to get it fixed when I get the money. You'd look at me like I was crazy. You know, why would you preach like that? What's the purpose? You're trying to put on a show. See, it's I want to be respected. Oh, brother. 
Oh, that sermon this morning. Oh, it was so good. Oh, it was just wonderful. That's why you're doing it. The Lord didn't call anybody to preach that way. I can tell you that. And, you know, this this guy, I was watching this other sermon last night, and this this guy, it was just incredible. I mean, he's just preaching, and he's going on, and then he's going to preach, and then he's going to, you know, like that. And it's just, just stop, okay? Why do you need to preach in some new voice that you don't normally speak with? You know, if you're talking about something that you're passionate about, raise your voice, yell a little bit, that's fine. But to put on a stage voice when you go up behind the pulpit, that is not of the Lord. That is a man pleaser. You are trying to get an audience. And I hate to tell you, but a lot of the biggest preachers that everybody respects and everything, they were nothing but man pleasers. Amen. you got to watch out for that. And it's amazing because sometimes right in the middle of one of these rants where they're really going off and, you know, and everything, they'll start saying false doctrine or false teaching. And it's like, hold on a second. If you are spirit-filled right now and you are really getting the, and the Holy Spirit's pouring out through you, why is false doctrine coming out of your mouth? And I've heard that thing time and time again. And a lot of times these big evangelists that, that, are, that you know, scream and yell and they can hit the first three rows with their spit you know i mean a lot of times those people that do that they'll go they'll they'll hit three verses they'll read three verses of scripture in an hour of preaching and the whole thing is just their words and people come up oh brother you're so good no he's not you know you have a responsibility to stay in the book comparing spiritual things with spiritual not carnal. Okay? And you can make illustrations. I'm not saying you can't. I'm just, you know, you got to be careful of that. Galatians chapter 1 verse 10 says, For do I now persuade men or God? Think about that one. Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. A real preacher is not going to please men. Okay? I mean, you'll, you'll get some that say, you know, that, yeah, that was good but most are going to hate your guts. Uh, Paul didn't want to be a man pleaser. Why not? Because it leads to being a cult. The people start to worship you. Look over at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 4. And here you have this very carnal, very fleshly church. Okay? Um, For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God, ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building." According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Okay, we're going to get into this a little bit more uh, here as we get further ahead. I don't want to get ahead of myself. But you have no business calling yourself anything but a Christian. And beware of any church that calls itself by the name of a man. I am of Paul. I am of Apollos. I am of Menno. I am of Luther. I am of Wesley. I am. Beware of that. Watch out for that. Because you will get trapped into a system of religious tradition. That came from a man. Okay? Jesus Christ is the head of our faith, the rock of our salvation, and nothing else. Be careful about that. Okay? Luke chapter 12, verse 13. Turn back to Luke chapter 12, verse 13. We're going to look at another one. And this one's kind of a tough one. Beware number four. Luke chapter 12, verse 13. Okay. Um, 
And one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother, that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, unto, and he said, This will I do, I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years, take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee, then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself, and is not rich toward God. Was it a sin for the man to have wealth? No. It's not a sin to be wealthy. But the sin came when he had an abundance of that wealth. And instead of saying, man, you know, I really got a good crop this year. And I have too much. I can't fit it into my barns. Instead of him saying, well, I got to build more barns. He should have said, well, you know what? I'm going to go and I'm going to give this to the poor. I have more than enough for myself. You know, I have plenty. My barns are full. So I'm going to take the abundance and I'm going to give it to the other people or have them come and get it for themselves. You know, he doesn't even have to do the labor. See, that would be the right thing to do. But instead... What he did was he tore down his barns and his barns were probably pretty nice, see, but they just weren't big enough, you know, they weren't just, just weren't quite good enough. So he tore down his barns and he built bigger barns, you know, shouldn't be that way, you know, and, and just as a, a way of, of thinking, uh, take a guy like Jay Leno, he's got a whole barn of vehicles. Why? Doesn't he have a car to drive? Of course he has a car to drive. But he has an overabundance of wealth. And so instead of saying, I've been blessed with money. Now he's not saved or anything. Far from it. But instead of saying, hey, I have a car. I have a good reliable vehicle. And now I have an abundance. I'm going to give it to other people. No, i, I got to get this rare car. And i got to get that car. And i got to get this one. And i got to get that one. And, and, and the, the thing is, it becomes a sickness. At that point, you know, the Bible says about they that love silver will not be satisfied with silver. That's how it is when you get rich and you become covetous. You are not content. You don't say, well, I have that. It's good enough. You know, you just want more and more and more and more and more. And it's not for I want more so I can give these away. It's I want more so I can keep them. And you actually get to a point and notice, too, it was not. You know, I'm going to eat more this year or something. No, he wanted to build a bigger barn so he could store it. See? So he could hoard the thing. And if other people out there are starving and whatever, hey, too bad. I got enough, you know, to last me for a very, very long time. Shouldn't be that way. Turn to Colossians chapter 3. Just look at two different passages here on the subject of covetousness. That's kind of tough, you know. Uh, watched the documentary on uh, people living out in the mountains and they were talking about how that they were poor and you know they just didn't have any money and they were eating the one uh, family said that they were eating potatoes three times a day you know you wouldn't have much to covet uh, after out there in the hills but it's tough when you live in a, in a more civilized area and you you know you get on the internet and you get catalogs and everything, you can covet. And it's not wrong to have things, but the question is, why do you want all those things? Are you going to share them with other people, or are you going to hoard them? Okay, uh, Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. Mortify, mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which sake the wrath of God cometh on, for which things sake, 
excuse me, the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Okay, you see covetousness, which is idolatry. You can get to a point where you start to hoard, you know, your goods. I want to build a bigger barn so I can get more of it in there and everything, and it becomes an idol. Okay, turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 24. This is what a Christian, you know, this is a, a good one uh, for a Christian to live by. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 24. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. You know, that's really what we should be concerned with as Christians. You know, that we should seek other people's wealth. If God prospers you, you should say, what can I do with this to help somebody else? Okay? And I think it'd be great if God would prosper each one of us with a million dollars if we use it to help somebody else. See? You know, if it's just for ourselves so we can build some big house and live out in the country someplace and, and keep people away, well, that's not right. If God prospers you, you should seek other people's wealth. You should look for people that need the help. And, of course, you know, I know here in America you got to be so careful now because there's so many people with the welfare mentality of, I'm not going to work, I just want a handout. You know, shouldn't be that way. You, and, and there are people that are sincerely, you know, you have a lot of women in this country that have a couple kids and their husband takes off and they really truly are struggling. They have to work two and three jobs just to try and make ends meet. You know, there, there are situations like that. And we should look for those types of people to help, you know, and it's going to get a lot worse. You know, the economy is not going to get better. It's just going to keep getting worse. And so there's going to be people out there that actually do need help. Um, but beware of number four, which is covetousness. Okay? Philippians chapter 3, verse 2 is the next beware. Beware number five. Philippians chapter 3, verse 2. Okay. Um, beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. So you have three bewares there in that one verse. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh. If any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin and Hebrew of the Hebrews as touching the law a Pharisee concerning zeal persecuting the church touching the righteousness which is in the law blameless but what things were gained to me those I counted loss for Christ yea doubtless and I count all things but loss for the ex excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I might that I may win Christ and be found in him not having mine own righteousness which is of the law but that which is through the faith of Christ the righteousness of which is of God by faith okay now notice there are three groups in verse 2 dogs evil workers and the concision okay now we're not going to look at each of these in great detail but what are dogs false prophets basically you know that's a, a dog is a canine a wolf is a canine uh, evil workers well if you're working that's good but if you're an evil worker you'd be a hypocrite beware of the leaven of the Pharisees which is hypocrisy so you have your evil workers there concision okay what is the concision well I think that this is the only time that that word shows up in the entire Bible and basically, it is somebody who uh, is doing good works and fleshly, outward types of righteousness type of things. And I want to talk about that uh, as far as verse 5 and 6 are concerned. Um, here Paul is not bragging. He's just saying, if 
you know, I do have some things I could brag about. And he goes into the fact that he was a Jew, he was a Pharisee. You know, he has some things, but he says, you know, down there in verse 8 that he counts them but dung. Okay, we're going to get back to that in a minute too. But just something I want to warn about um, is this Messianic Jew movement. This thing is just spreading like wildfire right now. And you have all these Gentiles walking around saying that they're Jewish and that they're studying Hebrew words and they're trying to change the whole Bible, the New Testament, into Hebrew and all that. Um, but let's just look about this thing, whether we should be calling ourselves Jews or not. Romans chapter 2. Keep your hand there in Philippians chapter 3. But let's turn over to Romans chapter 2, verse 28. Okay, Romans chapter 2, verse 28. For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men but of God. Now, across the board, every single one of these new Messianic Jew guys they're all fleshly, every single one of them. The guys start to grow their hair long. They get these huge long beards and things, and they start wearing Jewish types of clothing and adornments, and they start, you know, trying to look Jewish. But you're not a Jew outwardly, okay? And for a Gentile to try to act like he's a Jew is ridiculous. Um and something you need to be careful about too. Revelation 2.9 says, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Be careful about that. You say, well, what if somebody is a Jew and they get saved? You know, shouldn't they be going around and saying about Yeshua and all this stuff? You know, well, turn over to Galatians chapter 3. Verse 28, we're going to see about that. Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. Okay. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Okay, now obviously, there is Jew, there is a Greek, you know, there is male, there is female, obviously. But the point is, this passage is talking about what do you call yourself? You know, the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch, Acts chapter 11, verse 26. You are to call yourself a Christian, not a Jew, not oh, I'm a Messianic Jew. No, you're not. You know, I remember I've told this story before, but I'll just say it again. But uh, I saw a black woman driving a car, and she had a bumper sticker on the back of her car saying some Messianic Jewish thing, the seed of Abraham. And I thought, yeah, uh-huh, you know, a black Jew, sure, okay, right, you know. And it's no different than, you know, these white guys coming out. You know, this one guy, um, Michael Rood, I think his name is, and he makes all, all these videos, and he dresses up in the robes and... I mean, everything. And it's like his real name, I forget what his real name is, but the guy's from California. You know? <laughs> and he's a Jew. Uh huh. And he, he, in his videos, he, the Gentiles this and the Gentiles that. You're a Gentile, you know? That's ridiculous. And you're not supposed to be that. If you're a Christian, if you are, even if you are a pure Jew in Israel, when you get saved, you don't go around saying, I'm a Jew. I'm a, you know, Messianic Jew. You say, I'm a Christian. See? And it's interesting because, like I said, all these Messianic Jew people, all without exception, will change their outward appearance. Why? Because it's fleshly. It's not of the Lord. Okay? That's what the concision is. It's a fleshly outward thing where they're trying to show, you know, look at me. I'm outwardly righteous. You know, and, and watch out for fleshly outward shows of righteousness. 
Uh, okay, go back to Philippians chapter 3. You know, I want to say a couple things here quick. Then we'll move on. I just wanted to throw these in there um, about dogs. Something that's kind of interesting. Um, verse 8 says, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I, that I may win Christ. Paul's opinion of outward shows of righteousness was that they are dung. It's interesting because Isaiah chapter 64 verse 6 says that all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Okay? Having outward righteousness is dung, basically. And I'm going to try not to be too crude here, but uh, what do dogs like? <laughs> There's not a dog on this planet. I don't care if some city woman living in New York City has a little toy cup poodle that's been bred and, uh, you know, really fine dog. You let that thing down in a field, it'll go right to a dung, a pile of dung, and it'll roll in it. And it wants to be all over it, you know? Isn't that interesting that that's the picture that God gives of somebody who's self righteous? And they wear all the dung on them, you know? <laughs> They have their degrees and they have their outward ordinances and, and our women wear coverings and all these different things. And it's out it's outward. You could be a rotten individual inside, but you have your outward ordinances, don't you? You have your outward fleshly things that people at a distance can tell that I'm a Christian. It's dumb. That's all it is. And it's interesting too because if a dog gets that on them, what does it do? It attracts other dogs. <laughs> the other dogs get jealous. They come over and, they, you know, they start sniffing at it. And, hey, you know, where'd you get that? <laughs> you know? I mean, that's that's what the Lord puts in there. Dogs and all this stuff is dumb. You know? But something else I wanted to say quickly. And that is a dog. Do you ever see a dog that's lost? You know, down in Central America. I don't know if it was like that in Iraq or not. But you have these street dogs. Mm -hmm. You know, all over the place. Did, when a dog gets lost, are they, you know, sitting there crying and stuff, you know, because they lost their home? No, not at all. They're just walking around, you know, and hey, look at this. And hey, there's something I'll eat that and I'll roll in this. And, and there's, you know, another dog over there. I'll go fight with that. for. They don't care that they're lost. Isn't that interesting that that's how unsaved people are a lot of times? They don't care that they're lost. They are not concerned. They're not sitting around crying and weeping saying, I got to find my way back home. I'm lost. They don't care. They just walk around. They do what they feel like doing in life. And you go, hey, come here, come here, come here, come here, boy. I want to take you home. They run away. Exactly. They don't want to be caught. They don't want to be taken back to their master. They want to be lost. thought that was interesting. Beware number six. The final one. Colossians chapter two, verse eight. Okay, this is a good one. And in, of course, the new versions change it. They mess it all up. Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. Uh, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Um, Mark chapter 7, verse 13 says, Making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered, and many such like things do ye. Uh, one of the things that will get you messed up very quickly as a Christian is traditions of men. If you can't find it in the Bible, you better question it. You know, you better look at it. And we're going to go through the little list here in just a second. But uh, what's listed there as something that will spoil you is philosophy. And isn't it interesting that that's now being taught in a lot of the Bible colleges? They call themselves Bible colleges, but, you know, they're just worldly places for worldly Christians. But it says, spoil you. 
What what uh, is a characteristic of something that's spoiled? It's rotten. <laughs> you want to be a rotten Christian? Then go study philosophy. Isn't that interesting? But uh, what are the rudiments of the world? Well, uh, I know Ruckman talked about this, and I think he's got some good points. He listed seven different rudiments, things that the devil can use to trap anybody or to cause people to sin. And here are the different things. Everybody else does it. We always have done it. A little bit doesn't hurt. My conscience doesn't convict me. We know when to quit. you got to make a living. It all depends on how you look at it. Now those little statements there are what people will use to justify sin. Well, I know when to quit. Yes, not a big deal. I mean, I know other people that do it. Everybody else does it, you know. We always have done it. That's what they'll use. But things that you should consider, if you want to say rudiments for Christians, things that you should consider, seven things that you should ask yourself before you do anything. Number one, is it right and in line with Scripture? Will it please God? Does it edify? In other words, does it help other Christians? Is it expedient? Will it help me? Okay. Will it bring glory to God? Can I sincerely thank God for it? How will it appear at the judgment seat of Christ? Before you do anything, you should ask yourself those questions. You should consider those things. Okay? Um, something else that kind of goes in line with this uh, Colossians 2.8 verse is over in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20. Okay? Turn over there to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Grace be with thee. Amen. There are a lot of Christians that try to to uh, reconcile evolution and the Bible. Not going to happen. Isn't going to happen. Global warming and the Bible. Not going to happen. At least not till the end of the Millennium Kingdom. Then there's going to be some global warming. <laughs> you know. But uh, there's a lot of science, quote unquote, eugenics and the whole vaccination thing, and a lot of it, that a lot of Christians are trying to reconcile it and trying to make it spiritualized, you know, trying to make it Christian. You can't do it. Watch out for things that are called science that are not science, okay? And that goes right in with this philosophy thing. A lot of Christians want to have that worldly wisdom. They want to fit in. They want to be respected. They're man-pleasers. They want to have a degree in philosophy and they want to, you know, understand all this science, this well-established field of science. Most of what is called science today is nothing but fairy tale. It's ways to explain away God and the Bible. It's ways to justify sin is what most of it is. Um, but this mentality, turn over to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 7. This is where we're going to finish it. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 7. This is where this uh, philosophy, which philosophy, by the way, is love of wisdom, is what that the root word of that is. It's it, philosophy means the love of wisdom, and that leads to Second Timothy chapter three verse seven, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. You know, and it's like Paul said, he sought to know nothing. I'm paraphrasing the verse, but but Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's really all you need to know as a Christian. We have a perfect Bible in the King James Bible. We have a perfect Savior who died for us. You know, and these atheists, they will come up with all kinds of little oppositions of science falsely so called. They'll come out with all this stuff. All you need to do is just say, Are you saved? Are you a sinner? If you die tonight, would you go to heaven or hell? You know? That's really all you need. So, the six bewares. Number one, beware of false prophets. Number two, beware of false doctrine. Number three, beware of man-pleasers. 
Number four, beware of covetousness. Number five, beware of fleshly works. And number six, beware of philosophy and tradition. Okay, that's it. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.